It's, um, it's a great honor uh, to be here with all of you. I was delighted that I could come to the event that opened your um, meeting um, on the Commons just about an hour ago with the Wampanoag uh, Indian representatives um, taking part. And we all stood together and had many different banners, um, and none of them were the American flag. I was very proud. Um, I'd also like to um, announce something that I guess is going to be announced um, officially, but I heard it early, and that is that there is a new Women's Caucus um, of the Veterans for Peace, and I think that's a very healthy sign. That really says... That really says that Veterans for Peace, as a national growing organization, is getting smarter. <laughs> Any organization that does not have a women's caucus is underdeveloped. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to suggest to all of you, both the women and the men here, and that is take this caucus really seriously. The caucus will make you, make you and all of us smarter about your own organization, It'll make us all smarter about what it means to be a veteran, which is gendered. It is not the same for men as it is for women, despite all the commonalities. And it will make us smarter about not just war, but militarism. Listen to this caucus. It will make us all smarter. Um, so I'm delighted to have heard early about the organization of this caucus. Um, and that's one of the things that I've learned over the years, and that is that the way in which militarism happens, and I use a kind of long word, militarization, and the reason I use that word is because of the ization parts. You know, like socialization and industrialization. Well, ization, um, as awkward as it is to say, um, in fact reminds us that it's a process. And it's a process that goes on person by person, town by town, government by government, organization by organization. And it's a hopeful term, is militarization. The hopefulness of, is it, of it is that you can stop it. That is, if it's just militarism, then it sounds as though it comes to you on a Tuesday morning and there's nothing you can do about it. Or it comes to a government all at once because of one election. That's actually not how it works. Militarization creeps in, it insinuates itself into political parties, into hometowns, into universities who think they have to depend on defense money, into the psyches of people who think the only way they can prove their manhood is by joining the military. It is a creepy process, militarization is. And that's why it is so effective. And that's why it takes so many brain cells to watch it. And that's why it takes so many voices to say, stop, this is, where, this is the path you're on. Now, that militarization process does not happen in the same way for women as it does for men. And this has to be really taken seriously. You cannot militarize a man unless you can militarize his mother. You cannot militarize a veteran, a male veteran coming home, unless you can militarize his wife or his girlfriend. That is, for all the people here in the room who have been militarized and then tried to reverse it, and my guess is that's all of you, you know how hard it is to reverse the militarization of your mind and of your reputation and of your job skills and of your voting. It is hard to reverse militarization. Militarization happens because a lot of women are persuaded it's best for you. Look at the most recent Pentagon recruiting ads. Now, I should tell you, you've got to be careful about your post office because the Pentagon has gotten much more sophisticated. They have marketing people working for them, of course. 
And they have independent ad agencies. A lot of ad agencies are deeply militarized because it's a very uh, lucrative um, advertising account to get the Pentagon advertising account. But they've gotten very sophisticated now. And they put their advertising recruiting literature now, not just in any old post office. Some of us here in the room come from Cambridge, right across the river. No advertising there. Really, I, used, I do a lot of my research in post offices, right? Because I collect recruiting ads, right? To see how women and how men are presented in the ads to lure them into thinking that the military is the only way to get a decent education. That the, in, the military is the only way to prove you're a first class citizen. That the military is the only way um, to prove your manhood. The military is the only way to prove you're a liberated woman. Right? So I follow recruiting ads. But down in Key West, Florida, they think they have a much better chance of recruiting young people. And so in the Key West post office, which of course I also visited to do research, um, that's the only reason I was in Key West. Uh, but I went and I, the, um, Pentagon now puts out its recruiting literature both in Spanish and in English. This started especially during the wars in Central America. Um, and they had a recruiting ad very prominently displayed that had two sides to it. The first side was a young man that you were to imagine was a young Hispanic uh, American man. And he was looking at the camera and saying how proud he was to serve in the military. And then on the accompanying photograph uh, that was part and parcel of the same ad was a picture of a 50-something supposedly Hispanic woman. And she was looking right at the camera and said how proud she was of her son now. The Pentagon knows a thing or two about motherhood. The Pentagon knows that women who are mothers worry about their son's manhood. That women who are mothers worry about their son's adulthood. As a woman in upstate New York said to an interviewer not long ago, I need an, I'm a single parent. I'm a single mom. I'm raising a teenage boy. And he's become a couch potato. I've never wanted him, she told the interviewer, I've never wanted him to join the military. That's not the future I actually looked forward for him. I want him to go to a state college. I want him to get a job that has skills that will make him a useful young person. But he's become a couch potato. He sits here in the living room, he can't get a job, we don't have enough money for him even to go to the local community college. And I don't know what to do. And when the recruiter came along and promised that his joining the military would help me be an effective single mom because it would help me get him to achieve some of the things I want for him, especially that he'll become mature, that he'll become a real adult, he'll get off the couch and become a man. And she said to the interviewer, I took a deep sigh and I said, okay, I need another parent and if the, the military is going to be the other parent, I accept. That's called a recruiter's day in heaven. So militarization does not happen just of men. And it doesn't just happen of women in the same way it happens to men. The only way we're going to be able to stop the kind of militarization that makes us as a country so susceptible to a militarized foreign policy. And that's not just of this administration. It's going to be of the next administration or two administrations from now. It's a big mistake, I think, to think that the George W. Bush administration is really, really peculiar. It is an extreme version of a lot of other American administrations. And I say this as somebody who's going to vote for Kerry. 
In this, in political life, you make distinctions, but that doesn't mean you ignore the commonalities. And the commonalities are the things that go on in our heads, in our neighbors' heads, in our relatives' heads, in our workmates' heads. And those are ideas of, that feed militarization. And one of the most powerful ideas is about proving masculinity. One of the great advantages of now having so many fem feminist observers of US foreign policy and of the US military as an institution is that we are now having to take masculinity seriously. And we're going to have to take it seriously inside peace organizations as well. And this is tough to do. It's particularly tough when you think that as a peace organization, you feel as though you're yourself under siege. You feel as though you're such a small minority. You feel as though your voice isn't being heard. How can we possibly take time out, use our precious energy to talk about masculinity as it operates inside our own organization? But you know what? We have to do that. We have to actually act as though women's experiences of the privileging of masculinity, including inside of peace organizations, matters. It's not trivial. And one of the ways we're going to learn this is by listening to women in other countries, not just to women in the US. Women in other countries that I work with, or I should really put women in other countries who teach me, we're all learners. And in the last several years, I've been particularly taught, and this, I'm being very precise here now, about the feminists in other countries who've taught me about how even peace movements can get masculinized. 